Welcome to the last and the fifth part of this lecture on bevel gears and worm gears in the course Advanced Machine Elements at Luna University of Technology. Um, now we will be talking about forces and efficiency of worm gears. And when it comes to the forces and the normal force acting on the gear tooth, and you see it right here, Fn is divided into components as we did previously for the bevel gears so we have the radial force we have the axial force and the peripheral force and these are coupled to the normal force using alpha n which is the angle shown right here the pressure angle and gamma 1 which you find down here uh, now these uh, schematics they show for instance section BB which is this BB and that's the worm in this case uh, where we can find these equations to describe the forces and the components for the worm. In a similar manner uh, we can do the same thing for the worm gear now we have section AA which means that we are looking at the worm gear here and again we have the radial, axial and peripheral forces related to the normal force uh, using the pressure angle and this time we're using beta 2 which is the angle down here um, now when it comes to uh, forces and worm gears uh, normally in gears you can uh, discard the friction force because the contribution is relatively low compared to the other forces that are acting but in worm gears you need to take the friction force into consideration uh, because it has a relatively large contribution to the overall dynamics of the system so we now divide the friction force into the actual friction force FA1 mu and FP1 mu which is the peripheral friction force and in the uh, um, schematic here to the right you have the normal force and you have the friction force mu times Fn shown right there uh, and then we need to add the gamma 1 angle uh, sinus and cosinus for uh, case 1 here uh, we do the same thing uh, Fa2 mu and Fp2 mu and then we use the beta angle when we're talking about the worm gear. Um, now that we have defined the forces, we have divided the normal force into components, we also divide or uh, define the friction forces and its components. Uh, we can then uh, put up an equation for the torque uh, in the system. So T1 uh, is D1 over 2 times FP1 which is the peripheral force plus minus I'll come back to that just in a, in a minute uh, FP1 mu which is the friction force component based on the expressions that we have derived just on the previous slides we can get the expression D1 over 2 and then we have cosine for the pressure angle sinus for gamma and we have plus minus mu times cosine for gamma 1 uh, in the same way we have T2 and we do the same thing and we end up with D2 over 2 cosine for the pressure angle cosine for beta 2 and we have mu times sinus for beta 2 now you may notice that we have plus minus here and we have minus plus here now the reason for that is the s you choose the sign depending on whether it is the worm that is driving or whether it's the worm gear that is driving so as a rule here the upper sign meaning plus in this case and minus in this case is used when the worm is driving and the lower sign when the worm gear is driving um, now the efficiency uh, we define that as the torque times the angular velocity omega 2 so we have t1 omega 2 t2 o omega 1 um, this 
can then be rewritten using the equations and the schematics shown in the previous slide into an expression which can be also simplified further down to 1 minus coefficient of friction mu tangent beta 2 over cosine for the pressure angle divided by 1 plus the coefficient of friction uh, cotangent gamma over cosine is alpha n the pressure angle uh, and this is in the case when the worm is driving if the worm gear is driving meaning reverse system when typically you're driving the system by rotating the worm uh, and if you try to rotate the system using the worm gear that is considered to be the reverse or the opposite way of operating the system so we get a, a fairly similar expression uh, the difference is mainly that we have some we have the other angles we have beta 2 here for instance and beta and gamma 1 up here um, now if we would look at these equations a little bit in more detail and start putting numbers into these equations uh, two things will become evident uh, one that the efficiency is different depending on whether the worm or the worm gear is driving the system you saw that from the equations that they were not exactly the same so then you will not have the same as uh, efficiency obviously and the relation is that the uh, efficiency f when the worm is driving is greater than when the worm gear is driving since we have uh, gamma 1 equal beta 2 and that is less than 45 degrees so you can try to put those numbers and some uh, relevant numbers for the other parameters and then you will see what comes out in the end now the second thing that becomes obvious is that when you do the reversed operation meaning that you're trying to rotate the worm gear uh, the um, the efficiency actually becomes less than zero for some values for the gamma 1 and some values of uh, the coefficient of friction now what does this mean? Well, if you have a efficiency which is lower than 1, that means that there is no power going through your system. You're not transmitting any power. This means that the gear is self-locking, so nothing really happens. I mean, if you try to rotate the worm gear, the worm will not move at all. And this occurs when mu is greater or equal to this relation, uh, cosine for the pressure angle times tangents for the uh, for gamma 1 so to summarize the parts and worm gears uh, a worm gear it has a compact design and it enables ge high gear ratios even very high gear ratios um, which is very very beneficial uh, it also gives you the possibility of self-locking meaning, meaning that the system cannot reverse itself you have to drive the system using just one of the gears the other one will not the system will not move if you try to do the opposite um, on the downside it has a high de degree of sliding which uh, generates a lot of heat so this means that you need to have good lubrication to keep friction levels and wear rates at a reasonable level and you probably also need to add cooling to your system to keep the overall temperature of the of the gear system at a reasonable level for at least for continuously operating systems uh, these are the references that I have used for these five parts of the lectures there are two Swedish books and one English book so you may find more information here if you uh, have any specific uh, questions regarding the contents of this lecture. So with that I thank you for your kind attention listening to these five parts. I hope you have enjoyed it and please feel free to contact me if you have any questions regarding these lectures.